Hey there. Anybody online? Hello, Minister. How are you? Hey, Eamon. How are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So. good. So we're just preparing to start. Um, I'll be rolling a video at the beginning for everyone. So I'll just ask everyone to turn their cameras off and then we'll introduce you, Jackie Gilna from ICOT will introduce you and we'll begin the Q&A. Are we, are we doing the Q&A first or is there a presentation first? Or? Your address, uh, Minister, uh, we'll roll the video. I will then come on for two or three sentences, speak with you, and you will roll straight into your address followed by Q&A. Great. As per, okay. the, as per the sheet, thank you. Super, yeah, no worries. All right, so I'll just get, I'll prepare to commence now, thank you. Coveney, husband, father, farmer, sports fan, former rugby player, sailor, and an accomplished politician. Mr. Coveney was born in 1972 in Cork, and he attended Clongerswood College in Kildare, University College Cork, and Girton Agricultural College in Tipperary. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture and Land Management from the Royal Agricultural College in Gloucestershire. Mr. Coveney is an accomplished sailor, instructor, and lifeguard, and he led the Sail Chernobyl project, sailing over 30,000 miles across the world for charity. Following in the footsteps of his late father, Hugh Coveney, TD and Minister, Mr. Coveney is dedicated to public service, and he is described to me by his Oireachtas colleagues from all sides as detailed, willing to listen to other suggestions and ideas, and engage. 
He was first elected to the Doyle in 1998 as one of Fine Gael's youngest TDs, and he held shadow ministries in the areas of drugs and youth affairs, transport, communications, marine and natural resources. He was a member of Cork County Council and the Southern Health Board from 1999 to 2003. Elected to the European Parliament in 2004, he also authored the European Parliament's annual report on human rights in the world for the year 2004 and again for 2006. Mr. Coven chaired the Fine Gael Policy Development Committee prior to the 2011 general elections. He was appointed as Minister for Agriculture, Food and Marine on March the 9th in 2011 and Minister for Defence on July the 11th in 2014. In 2016, he was appointed Minister for Housing, Planning and Local Government. Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade with responsibility for Brexit on June 14, in 2017. And again on November 30, 2017, he was appointed Thornishta and Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade with once again the responsibility for Brexit. In June 2020, he was appointed to his current role as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence. Mr. Coveney is also the deputy leader of Fine Gael. Good afternoon. I'm Jackie Gilner, President and Chair of the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce in Ottawa and the Pan Can Chambers. It is my great pleasure on behalf of my colleagues in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, here in Ottawa, and for the Centre of Commerce in Calgary, to extend a warm welcome to Minister Covey on a virtual visit to Canada, and indeed to our audience tuning in from Ireland, Canada, England, Scotland, and the United States. We do hope you enjoyed that very quick uh, visit to Canada and our start visit to Ireland. Minister Coveney will start us off with opening remarks, which will be followed by Q&A. Minister, a very warm Irish-Canadian welcome to you. It's absolutely terrific to have you with us here today. Thanks very much. And uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here. And uh, I look forward to your, to your questions in a few minutes. Maybe just to set the context, if I could say a few words first, just to, uh, to highlight the importance, really, of the relationship between between Canada and Ireland. Uh, and first of all, I want to extend a very warm welcome uh, to the representatives of the Canadian and Irish business communities who are joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak uh, to you on the rich relationship that's shared between our two countries, a relationship which I have a very personal stake in, uh, as my wife uh, has many siblings uh, living in Canada. In fact, she's one of 12 children and seven of her brothers and sisters now live in Canada and have full Canadian citizenship. Um, so if ever I'm uh, escaping from Ireland and looking for a new home, I think there's a pretty good chance it'll be, it'll be Canada. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Jackie Gilne, uh, Gilne uh, uh, Turton uh, and the team at the Pan-Canadian Irish Chambers of Commerce for the invitation to address you today, and also for the tremendous work uh, that they've put into organizing this event. In recent years, relationships between Ireland and Canada have flourished by virtue of our shared values, our strong people-to-people -people links, and our growing economic ties. As champions of democracy, of human rights, of free trade, and, are, and a rules-based international order, we share the same values and many of the same perspectives. Canada has been a stalwart and committed defender of multilateralism and a very reliable friend on the global stage to Ireland. We cooperate closely on the United Nations, where we <clears throat> promote respect for international law, for sustainable development, for human rights, and for the need to take effective action to solve some of the enduring challenges of our time, wherever they may be on the planet. As we saw during the EU-Canada summit just last week, the relationship between Canada and our EU partners continues to strengthen and develop also. And there are many areas where we share common ambitions and perspectives. Ireland's relationship with Canada, like all great business relationships, is based on our people-to-people -people links, connections and friendships. Canada is unique in having both historic and new Irish communities. It was my honour to visit Canada for St. Patrick's Day in 2017. And whilst there, uh, I remember it very well, actually, because it was the coldest ever St. Patrick's Day in Ottawa. 
um, and uh, uh, we had a great time. But it was uh, it was a lesson to me in uh, uh, in what it's like to live in minus twenty five degrees. Uh, I was struck by the size, though, and the vitality of the Irish community and their organizational strength as well. Today, one in seven Canadians, that's four and a half million people, still claim Irish heritage. During the last recession, some 10,000 Irish people moved to Canada annually. They were welcomed with generosity and a spirit of openness that is so typical of Canada. Many have stayed, settled down and become permanent residents. Some of my extended family have married in to Canadian families. These recent, this recent wave has added the vibrancy and vitality um, to our diaspora uh, in Canada uh, and has greatly benefited our business and economic connections now and for the future. In February 2019, I launched Ireland's strategy for the US and Canada 2019 to 2025. It commits the government to increasing our support for the diaspora and in doing so, fostering greater, greater social, cultural, and economic links. The strategy sets out an ambition of significantly increasing the value of our bilateral trade and economic connections, and places this commitment at the heart of our relationship with Canada. COVID-19 has posed many challenges to Irish and Canadian businesses alike, and the growing strength and potential of the Irish-Canada relationship will, in my view, be crucial to economic recovery for both of our countries. The Irish government has continued to support trade and economic growth with a strategic political focus on Canada. It would be true to say that we have prioritized this political and trading relationship uh, to the very top uh, and small number of countries that are seen as a priority for Ireland. We're continuing to devote additional new resources to that relationship. Following on from the opening of the new Consulate General in Vancouver in 2018, we plan now to open a new Consulate General in Toronto also. We're also advancing the development of our state agency operations in Canada as well. For example, Education in Ireland has recently appointed an education pathfinder for Western Canada to identify new opportunities and develop existing connections. Prior to the, to the pandemic, we saw a dramatic expansion in vital direct air connectivity between Ireland and Canada, alongside a remarkable increase in bilateral tourism going both ways. Once conditions for travel improve, we are absolutely committed to seeing these air connections and positive trends return. Indeed, I note the good news that the Air Canada Toronto Dublin direct route will be resuming from the 2nd of July in just a few weeks time. A look at the growth of recent years tells us how much Ireland and Canada stand to gain from our developing relationship. Since CETA provisionally entered into force in 2017, Irish exports to Canada have increased dramatically. I was looking at the numbers. Uh, in terms of goods trades, trade, it's almost doubled. And in terms of services, it's increased by 45 to 50 percent, which is incredible in the, short, in the space of just a couple of years. Barriers to investment for Canadian companies have been lowered, and there are now 75 such companies, including household names like Shopify and Canada Life, employing 15,000 people now in Ireland. Premium products such as beef and whiskey are now more available than ever to people all across Canada, from British Columbia to Newfoundland, because of the reduction or elimination of tariffs on these products alongside many others. The government that I'm part of is committed to finalizing Ireland's ratification of CETA following the necessary parliamentary procedures. CETA will ensure that Irish and Canadian SMEs, investors and exporters are well positioned to fully explore the opportunities offered by this agreement while enjoying significant rights and protections as well. This is an agreement that both Canada and Ireland, I think, can benefit hugely from. In closing, I want to commend the work of the Ireland Canada Chamber of Commerce in continuing to highlight and develop the excellent economic and business opportunities that our relationship offers. The Pan-Canadian the Pan Irish Chamber of, Chambers of Commerce initiative is an opportunity to realize the full potential of Ireland Canada trade and it's very welcome 
as we look to a post-COVID period, I hope of growth, renewal and sustainability. I also want to acknowledge here the excellent work of our ambassador in Ottawa, Eamon McKee, and his embassy team, and also our Consul General in Vancouver, Frank Flood, and his consulate team, as well as all our honorary consuls across Canada who work tirelessly to strengthen the Ireland-Canada relationship at every level. This is an exciting time for Ireland and Canada, a time that is rich with opportunities. Ireland and Canada remain open, outward-looking countries, proud champions of the benefits of international partnership and collaboration. I look forward to meeting with Irish and Canadian business communities in person. In the not too distant future, we will be able to travel again, meet again, socialize again, uh, talk and debate and discuss the issues of the day in person in the same room. But for now, I'm, of course, I'm happy to answer any of your questions and hear any of your constructive criticism or comments. Um, the one thing I would say just to finish uh, is that I, I think it is true that the personality of Irish people and Canadian people is really compatible. <laughs> I know that uh, not only from my wife's family, uh, where literally half of them are married to Canadians, um, but, but also from my time uh, in Canada. I've been lucky to travel to Canada on many occasions. Um, there is a, 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 a personality consistency, I think, between our two countries, the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves, uh, the way we do business, um, the trust uh, and uh, importance of building friendships and relationships to be the core of those business relationships. Uh, and so I think we now have a trade vehicle through CETA uh, that can allow us to, to really fulfill potential uh, in a way that I think is, is only getting started. You know, we've gone from pre-CETA to a couple of years after it, before COVID hit, uh, of dramatically increasing over the space of a number of years, our trade in goods and services. Uh, and I think that the, the post-COVID economic growth story uh, can, I think, uh, be one of really dynamic partnership and cooperation where Canada and Canadian companies and Canadian SMEs and Canadian exporters will see Ireland as a gateway into the European Union, particularly now that the UK has moved away from EU membership and is moving in a different direction. Uh, I think there's a really dynamic opportunity for Canada to see Ireland uh, as a portal into this huge uh, consumer economy of 450 million people in, in the EU single market, as well as, of course, uh, in the Irish economy itself. Uh, and likewise, I think we see you uh, as this enormous opportunity and gateway for a country that has built its, its economic growth story on the back of competitiveness, high quality and, and exports. Um, and I think, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but I think we're going to see a new economy develop now, or at least uh, a new perspective uh, in terms of economic growth, very much focused on sustainability and emissions management, where again, I think Ireland and Canada have a very similar perspective on what we need to do to give both moral, political and economic leadership globally. Uh, and again, some of the shared technology there, uh, I think, can be a big driver for economic growth as well. So I look forward to your comments and questions and thanks for, the for, for taking the time. Uh, to be to be with us today. Minister, thank you very much. And most certainly it's very poignant what you say. We do have shared values, very strong shared values between our two countries, which certainly will be the driving force to uh, economic recovery. Um, you have hit on a very wide spectrum of, of issues and uh, they reflect many of the questions that we had uh, put together based on our request to our viewers today. So uh, with a plethora of questions, we had to group them into uh, subject matters of interest in the interest of time. So I'd like to start with uh, Shopify, our goal sponsor uh, for today, who are also in Ireland, as you mentioned. So Shopify are asking, what are the greatest opportunities for Ireland in the post-pandemic economy? Um, well, first of all, I mean, we had a very strong and growing economy going into this pandemic, which, which put us in a fortunate position because we've been able to borrow enormous sums of money to try to keep businesses on life support, if you like. So we've effectively required businesses to close, particularly in the hospitality sector, in restaurants, in, uh, 
uh, anything linked to tourism, uh, hoteling and so on, they've largely been closed for a year. Um, but we've managed to keep the connection between employers and, in, and employees intact by, by supporting businesses through what has been extraordinary disruption. So, so I think you'll see some of the areas that were strong and growing in Ireland rebounding quite strongly uh, uh, in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, particularly around hospitality, tourism, travel, aviation, uh, and so on, where just getting back to where we were will result in very dramatic growth over a short period of time. And then I think you're seeing a new economy develop in Ireland, uh, particularly around energy and sustainability and uh, the targets that we've set. In fact, the targets that we've put into legislation now. So the Irish government is required by Irish law to, to reduce emissions in Ireland by an average of 7% per year. So, so by 51% by 2030, which um, considering some of the sectors of our economy are quite carbon efficient and emissions efficient at the moment is a big, big ask. So I think you will see a lot more people working remotely, for example. Uh, we've set a target across our public sector for up to 40% of our public sector workers working remotely or partly remotely during the week from home to try to reduce travel, to try to reduce emissions linked to travel. Um, we are we are also, in my view, at the start of, of a renewable energy revolution in Ireland. Uh, I think you will see very significant investment, and I mean billions of euros of investment in offshore wind uh, projects, because we have more consistent wind speeds off the west coast of Ireland than anywhere else in the world. Um, and we are figuring out a way now to, to attach that to our grid system uh, in a way that can allow us to become an exporter of renewable energy into the EU grid. So um, I, I'm sure some of the, um, the Canadian technology and energy companies may be interested in, in that opportunity. Um, and, uh, and in construction, you know, which is in some ways a, a sort of a basic economic driver, building houses and building buildings. Um, we, we need to be building uh, somewhere between 35 and 40,000 housing units in Ireland per year. Uh, because of our growing population. We're currently only building 15 to 20,000. So we essentially need to double housing output in Ireland, uh, which will be a big employment driver, a big investment driver, but we have to do that in a way that's far more sustainable than what we've done in the past. That means building higher buildings, higher density, um, urban living, but higher quality as well uh, to attract people to that option. Uh, and I think we could rely on a lot of Canadian expertise where there is a lot of expertise around high buildings, uh, which doesn't really exist in Ireland, to be honest. Um, so, so some of the new housing development, particularly around modular building and so on, uh, I think uh, provides real opportunities for outside investment and expertise uh, to come to Ireland. So energy, housing, transportation, um, uh, a sort of a resurgence in in hospitality and uh, uh, and and tourism, and as ever, the food industry in Ireland, even through the pandemic, has been getting stronger and stronger, uh, driven by exports. We export eighty five percent of all the food we produce. Some of that now to Canada, but only some of it. I know you're very precious in Canada about protecting your dairy industry in particular. Um, um, so we, um, we have a very good dairy industry as well, but we are, um, we're limited in terms of our options uh, in terms of exports to Canada. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't cooperate from a technical perspective in terms of becoming the best countries in the world uh, in, in terms of the carbon intensity of our food production systems. And I know there's a lot of really good research going on in, in Canada and in Ireland, uh, and perhaps we could do more to share. Um, we're doing a lot with New Zealand at the moment. We could do a lot more with Canada, I think, particularly in the dairy industry uh, around the, the, the emissions intensity of, of our dairy production systems. So loads of areas, I think, for growth. And uh, if you look at the foreign direct investment numbers for Ireland, in other words, the appetite to invest in building a, an international business from Ireland, uh, it's probably stronger than it's ever been. And that's still at the tail end of a, of, a, um, of a pandemic. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. One is Brexit, because many, many companies that would have looked to the UK as a gateway into the EU are now looking at Ireland, um, because it's the only English-speaking country 
left in the European Union. Um, and secondly, I think there is a sense that there's political stability in Ireland, despite the disruption of, of COVID. Um, uh, and you can build a very competitive business base uh, in, in the Irish economy to, to compete globally. Uh, and uh, so I hope we'll see many more Canadian companies choosing to do what, what some have already done uh, to, uh, to invest and take a risk on Ireland as a, as a home for global business. We do have a specific question as it relates to FDI and IDA, uh, which we'll address a little bit later on, which came in from, from a few people actually. But when we look at energy sustainability, construction, tourism, it certainly all sounds that the uh, economy is certainly going to return to its strength and beyond, and most certainly tremendous opportunity for employment and for the sharing of Canadian technologies, as you mentioned. So that brings me to, um, to your own department, Minister. How has foreign affairs changed with the COVID pandemic? And are the issues different now than before the pandemic began? Um, I think some of the issues are different. Uh, I think a number of things have happened during the pandemic. So first of all, there was a change in Washington, which, which, uh, which happened in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so uh, the, the new US president uh, takes a, almost a diametrically opposed position to, to his predecessor in terms of the approach to the UN, to multilateralism, to a rules-based order, to uh, interaction with allies. Um, he, you know, the, the Trump administration was very abrasive, uh, very combative, uh, combative um, you know, uh, pulled out of the, climate, uh, the, the Paris Climate Agreement, put out, pulled out of the UN Human Rights Council, um, uh, in many ways, President Biden is doing the opposite, going back into all of those organi organizations, uh, sort of doubling down on the need for the, the US to be a global leader in terms of multilateral structures, uh, whether that's development aid, uh, whether it's protecting democracy, promoting human rights, uh, ensuring that the, um, that the UN systems are funded and work as well as they can, despite the fact that, of, of course, they're flawed, but they are, they're the best that we've got. Um, so I think the combination of a, a change at the top in the world's superpower, which happens to be your closest neighbor, um, so it impacts on, on Canada, I know in a major way as well, um, but also has a huge impact on Ireland in terms of our influence in the world, because our influence in Washington is a big part of, of Irish foreign policy in terms of enabling an Irish voice. Um, and so I, I think uh, what the pandemic has forced, along with that change in Washington, has been a, a, um, uh, a renewal, if you like, of, of, of the focus on the power of the collective internationally, that big and small countries, no matter how powerful they are, uh, cannot manage a global pandemic on their own. And we've seen that tragedy unfold across the United States uh, and across other uh, big powers like Brazil and the UK and Italy uh, and so many others. Um, so uh, I think that, that COVID has forced us to think somewhat differently uh, about the need for uh, collective action on global challenges and problems, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's climate change, or indeed whether it's a platform for, for international trade, um, where there's a lot of discussion at the moment on international taxation, corporation tax, uh, to, to, to try to ensure that there aren't effectively tax havens uh, that are providing unfair platforms for business growth. And I think all of that is good. Uh, uh, certainly all of that is good for a small country like Ireland that relies on uh, a fair rules-based order that apply to superpowers as well as small countries like Ireland so that we get a fair shake in terms of, of uh, trade rules. Um, and um, so. So I think that has changed perspectives for the better, um, even though there's been a lot of negative linked to COVID, of course, uh, it's forced people to think globally uh, in a way that perhaps they, they weren't before. It's unfortunately forced some countries to think in a more protectionist way too, though, um, uh, in terms of their inability to be able to get, uh, you know, PPE or test kits and so on. And there was an over-reliance perhaps, for example, in China, 
uh, and on other parts of the world for some low cost but very important equipment to respond to a pandemic. So I think the world will, will look to make sure that they can supply themselves with essentials in the future. Um, but I hope that hasn't undermined a, a global way of seeing uh, economic growth, because I think from an Irish perspective and from a Canadian perspective, that's hugely important. Well, I think Minister, to your point about influence and from all the bad comes good, the bad of the COVID, so many good things have, have arisen from that. Um, and one of the areas that is of great interest to the diaspora as we follow everything that's going on at home is the following. Um, we saw you participate in the diaspora voting event back in March. And the question is, uh, this is an issue which is hugely important to the growing diaspora. Is there any indication of when the referendum might happen as the Irish diaspora board, of course, are tuning into all the developments? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. In one if minute. Yeah, yeah. If it hadn't been for the pandemic, it would have been happening this year. So um, because we have a few more years to go yet before a presidential election, we have a bit of time. So I suspect this will happen next year, um, hopefully early next year, uh, sometime in the spring, uh, when we are beyond the pandemic, I hope. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm a big advocate for, for this uh, initiative, whereby we want to open up uh, presidential voting rights to to the Irish diaspora across the world. We'll so in take, other words, we'll, we'll take that as a positive, and we'll. Oh no, yeah, no, like we will, we will make this happen. There are some skeptics. Don't uh, don't get me wrong. There are some people who think that this is going to skew the process of electing a president and so on. Uh, I have a lot of faith in the wisdom of of Irish people across the world. Uh, to vote for the right kind of person to represent Ireland at home and abroad and Irish people across the world uh, as a, you know, as a, a as Ireland's first citizen, if you like, uh, and the president. Um, so I look forward to the next um, uh, presidential election in Ireland being a global election. We'll have many viewers today very, very pleased with that response, Minister. So moving on with about two minutes or less to each question, and we're not going to get through them all. I'm going to pick out the most important as I see them. Um, and one very, uh, very qu a question that comes from the chambers and comes from the community and all the organizations, predominantly from the chambers on, the, on behalf of the members, how can the various chambers best support the semi-state agencies such as Enterprise Ireland, IDA, and Tourism Ireland. What can we do to best support those agencies? Yeah, well, talk to them as much as possible. That's the first thing. So, I mean, I mean, they should be there to support you as well. So that's why they're there. That's why. And I mean, you know, the IDA and Enterprise Ireland are fantastic organisations. You know, as indeed is is Education Ireland. So, you know, we want to make sure that. Um, that our agencies in Canada are plugged into business networks in the big cities, uh, not just in the ones where there are lots of Irish people, but of course those too. Um, but we are trying to uh, spread our roots, if you like, into the Canadian economy in a way that's permanent and sustainable. Uh, and that means that, that we need networks, uh, we need knowledge, we need experience. Uh, and when Irish companies are looking to set up in Canada, uh, uh, they need to be connected to the networks that you can provide. Um, just like when Canadian companies are coming to Ireland, uh, we hope that you can be confident that the networks in Ireland will make them feel very welcome as well. And the Chambers of Commerce in Ireland, as you know, are hugely welcoming and part of the, uh, the story of bringing uh, non-Irish companies to Ireland and making sure that they're a success. So we want to try to replicate that kind of relationship in Canada so when, when the Irish multinationals uh, are looking to expand into North America, into Canada, uh, that they have a, a welcome there and a network that they can tap into quickly. Well, we have expressed uh, our, our willingness to work alongside the state agencies. We have a shared purpose, of course. So we welcome, uh, we welcome uh, hearing from the minister. And if there's any of them on uh, watching us today online, please do get in touch. So moving on to a burning question uh, with about three minutes to answer, Max, uh, Minister, is the following. Canada is very supportive of CETA and we see the advantages for increasing Ireland-Canada trade links and beyond into other areas. However, there does seem to be some opposition to aspects of CETA back home in Ireland. 
Could you give us an update on, very briefly, on where Ireland is with CETA and let us know if there's anything we can do here to help address the concerns? Very big question in yeah. a very short time to answer. I realize that. Yeah, I mean, look, look, I mean, let me give you a sort of an honest and short answer to that question. So, so there, there are three parties in government in Ireland. Uh, two of them would like to get on with ratifying CETA tomorrow. Uh, the third party, when it was in opposition, that's the Green Party, was quite critical of elements of CETA, um, and uh, particularly around dispute resolution mechanisms and so on within the CETA arrangements. And so they have been on the record as being quite critical of CETA, uh, and therefore uh, we have agreed to a process of deliberation and discussion within parliamentary committees to work through some of the concerns that were there, which we believe there are very compelling answers to. Uh, there's also a legal challenge uh, to the ratification of CETA, which we need to get over. But let me just say, I am very confident that within the next few months, Ireland will be able to ratify CETA. We certainly won't be the last country in the EU to do it. We're very anxious to get on with it. We see the benefits of it. And of course, CETA is, is, is already in effect uh, and is, is working. But we do want to get on with the formal ratification process and the government has a stated commitment to do that in our program for government but we're just trying to make sure that we manage the politics of this and we bring everybody with us terrific and i would say to our um to our viewers to stay tuned to uh, the uh, department of foreign affairs news feed for for further updates our last question before um, we take it to the next segment minister and perhaps um you could this is something very near and dear, I believe, to yourself, um, following your, uh, your steps with the uh, Security Council. Um, the minister, as Ireland's term on the United Nations Security Council progresses, can you speak a little bit about the issues that Ireland is engaged in on that forum and how we can make a difference in two minutes and perhaps expand on that in the next segment? Yeah, so... Well, first of all, as many in Canada will know, we had a very competitive process to get onto the Security Council because unfortunately we, we, we were competing against Canada. So Ireland, Canada, and Norway uh, were competing for two, two places and it was extremely close between Ireland and Canada and Norway. And we were fortunate to, to get on the Security Council. The reason why it was extremely close is because Canada is very popular in the UN. So, um, we uh, were very like-minded on so many issues. Um, the issues that Ireland has specific responsibility for uh, are some of the most uh, divisive and difficult issues to resolve on the Security Council. So we are the, the, the formal facilitator for what's called the JCPOA, which is the Iranian nuclear deal on the Security Council, uh, to try to bring superpowers and the P5 together to put back in place a... Uh, a nuclear agreement with Iran that would guarantee international credible inspections of the Iranian system to make sure that they don't develop a nuclear bomb effectively. Um, and in return for that, um, uh, the, um, the other member states are willing to remove sanctions. That's a very delicate and difficult uh, management exercise and Ireland is very much involved in it. We're also involved as the pen holder along with Norway of guaranteeing humanitarian access into Syria. So about 13 million Syrians today rely on international aid to simply live day by day, week by week. And actually guaranteeing the flow of, of, um, of humanitarian assistance into Syria is incredibly political and very complicated. There is only one international uh, border crossing now through Turkey. And if we don't get an agreement in the next three weeks, that will close and there will be no way to get humanitarian assistance into Syria except through Damascus, which is almost impossible. So, you know, real issues on the ground, trying to save lives and support people. Um, we also are the co-chair of the, the uh, expert working group on climate and security, uh, on the, uh, which is something that Canada is very, very strong on. Uh, we, we also chair the Women, Peace and Security uh, to ensure that there is a gender element to managing and resolving conflict and peace processes to make sure that women are involved. Uh, all of the evidence suggests that, that the more women you have involved in peace processes and peace agreements, the more successful they are uh, and the, the more likely they are to last. Um, so, um, and also, unfortunately, we're very involved in a debate around the increasing use of sexual violence as a tool of war. Uh, we've been highlighting that, for example, in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, 
where there's an ongoing military operation uh, and a lot of brutality that, that we're shining a light on. So there are many areas where Ireland has a specific role to try to influence and shape the debate and the resolutions that emerge. And then, of course, we're involved in the general debates on everything. Um, you know, today it was Afghanistan. Um, uh, next week, uh, uh, it could be something entirely different. So, you know, Ireland is a small country, but we try to ensure that we have as big a voice as we possibly can, uh, while we have the, the privilege of being on the Security Council, which, which is roughly every, uh, once every 20 years. Well, it's a huge portfolio and phenomenal issues globally. And Ireland is a very small country, but we have a large voice and we are being heard. So thank you for the work that you're doing on that. Minister, I'm going to wrap up this session here. We have a number of other questions, but perhaps if you could just take with you into the next segment, um, if you could perhaps address briefly um, matters of the Good Friday Agreement and the EU summit last week. But on that note, within the time constraints, thank you very much. The subject matter is really significant on each question. So please, to our viewers, tune into the Department of Foreign Affairs newsfeed for updates on that. So we're now going to move to the discussion with yourself, Minister, and a man known to uh, many across the country. He hasn't sat still since he arrived, although not being able to leave the seat was difficult, but we've all met him coast to coast. It's our very own Irish ambassador to Canada, Dr. Eamon McKee. Um, and uh, Ambassador McKee has been speaking over as I said, coast to coast, representing uh, our country well and addressing the diverse interests of all the Irish and Irish Canadian communities here in Canada. So Ambassador McKee, it's curtains up and uh, for this session, so I'm handing over to you. Thanks very much, Jackie. And uh, just to I'm say sorry. thank you to you and the Pan Chamber for organizing this great event and Minister for making yourself available. I know you've been incredibly busy. Just. Uh, Jackie kind of mentioned it there, the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, we've had an extraordinary series of developments in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think it's now agreed that Jeffrey Donaldson will lead the DUP. Uh, the protocol issue has been uh, in the headlines. Uh, can you just give us your sense of where we're at at the moment and, and what are the sequence of events that we're likely to see pan out over the next few months? Um, I mean, I would be like you, I would share great confidence in the Good Friday Agreement but we have been roiled by events. Uh, just for our audience here, can you just give us a sense of where we're at? Yeah, I mean, we're not in a good place is the straight answer to that. Um, so we're lucky to have the Good Friday Agreement as a foundation that, that guides the, the debate and the discussion and keeps us, uh, uh, as they'd say in Ireland, between the ditches, you know, in terms of as we travel here on this difficult road. Um, but, you know, the truth is both unionist parties have changed their leaders. It, the larger of the two unionist parties, the DUP, has changed their leader twice now in the last month. And I mean, don't forget that the DUP has only ever had four leaders up until today. You know, Ian Paisley, Peter Robinson, Arlene Foster, uh, and then for a three week period, Edwin Poots. Um, but now, as of today, uh, Jeffrey Donaldson. Um, so it gives you an indication as to the pressure that is is it is currently evident within unionism in Northern Ireland. Um, there's, there's a reason for that. Um, you know, we've had a very difficult few years in, in the context of negotiating Brexit. Uh, the way in which the United Kingdom chose to leave the European Union was one of separation um, and diversification away from EU standards, EU approaches, EU regulations. The problem for Northern Ireland is that the Good Friday Agreement is, is all about common approaches. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the principles around the Good Friday Agreement that allowed it to work so well was that, that we would respect the difference of identity between Britishness and Irishness in Northern Ireland and respect the fact that as long as a majority of people in Northern Ireland wanted to be part of the UK, well, then that would be so. But because the UK as a whole, including Northern Ireland, was part of the EU and its single market and its customs union, effectively the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland became an invisible barrier. You know, it was a political border that you couldn't see, um, but it was not a trading border. And so what has reinforced relationships on the island of Ireland for the last 25 years since the Good Friday Agreement in 1998 has been 
um, uh, this normalization of trade, of movement, of interaction between North and South. And so much of the identity-based politics, while it was still there, and is still there very much so, uh, it was gradually being diluted through a normalization of interaction and trade and relationships. Of course, what Brexit has done is it has forced a change to that approach uh, because Brexit is all about leaving, doing things differently, Britain no longer being part of the union and its infrastructure and its customs union and its single market and all the other things that, that led to, uh, to very strong reinforcement of the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement. And so we had to find a way of dealing with the island of Ireland issues. How could we protect the Good Friday Agreement, the all-island economy, the north-south cooperation in the context of part of the island of Ireland leaving the European Union and the rest of it very much staying at the heart of the EU and its single market and customs union. And what we did at the start was we said, okay, we said to the British government, uh, and if, if this is a history lesson that you all know, stop me at any point, but I think it's, it's useful to give a context as to what's happened. Right. So the EU, first of all, didn't agree with the decision of the UK to leave, but they respected it, as did we. But, but in order to try to minimize the fallout and the damage of that decision, the EU said, well, okay, you're leaving the European Union, but why don't you stay in a shared single market? And the British government said, no, that's not the Brexit we want. We then said, well, look, if you don't want to stay in a shared single market, why don't you stay in the same customs union, a shared customs union, because that would at least limit the number of checks that would be required on goods and services and so on um, uh, to facilitate trade. No, the British government didn't want that. They wanted a more hardline Brexit than that. Then we said, okay, well, look, we have to deal with the Irish issue. So could we try to deal with the, the, the island of Ireland issue on a UK wide solution, which became known as the backstop, whereby the UK would temporarily effectively stay attached to the EU single market for goods in terms of standards, which would then not require any border infrastructure between North and South and the island of Ireland or East West between Northern Ireland and the UK. And Boris Johnson, Theresa May accepted that solution and thought it was a good solution, but Boris Johnson rejected it. <clears throat> and so, they narrowed their options. The kind of Brexit that they insisted on delivering was a Brexit that required a tailor-made solution for Northern Ireland on its own. And that tailor-made solution for Northern Ireland on its own, because the rest of the UK wanted to move in a different direction from a regulatory perspective, meant that um, the EU agreed to de facto extend the EU single market for goods to Northern Ireland, while respecting that Northern Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom and outside of the EU. Uh, it, was, like, it was an extraordinary, in some ways, act of generosity by the EU because Northern Ireland could then trade in an unfettered way into the rest of the United Kingdom, into Great Britain, and also trade freely into the EU single market through Ireland without any checks on the border whatsoever mm -hmm. in order to protect the Good Friday Agreement. Mm -hmm. The problem with, with that solution, which became known as the protocol, was that it had a price. And the price was that because Northern Ireland became part of the de facto extension of the EU single market for goods, it meant that Northern Ireland essentially, essentially could be an entry point into the EU single market for goods, which mm -hmm. means that goods coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland had to be checked in ports and airports. And for unionism, this is abhorrent because what they say is, uh, we don't care what the British government agreed, uh, this is undermining our Britishness because Northern Ireland as an economy now is more aligned to the standards of the EU in terms of, uh, of the single market for goods than to Great Britain. And how do you, um, how do you resolve those anxieties, Minister? So, so, so first of all, um, I mean, the British government knew these problems. You know, mm -hmm. we repeatedly talked about them. Um, we said, look, the consequence of doing a special arrangement for Northern Ireland is that there will need to be some checks on goods that come across the Irish Sea from east to west into Northern Ireland, not the other way, uh, because they are goods that are effectively entering the EU single market. And under you know, international trading rules, we have to know what's coming into our single market. Uh, yeah. Because of course, it can leak through Northern Ireland into the single market 
And what other countries like France and Germany and the Netherlands and Belgium will say is, we can't have an unguarded back door into our single market through Northern Ireland. We've got to check goods. So, you know, unionism and loyalism feels offended by this. They blame the Irish government for it. They blame the EU for it. And they blame Boris Johnson for it um, because they say that, um, that somehow they are slightly less British because they don't have the same kind of Brexit as the rest of the United Kingdom. Yeah. I don't accept that for one minute, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. I also don't accept that it's inconsistent with the Good Friday Agreement. Um, um, Brexit is, what is, is what's inconsistent with the Good Friday Agreement. The protocol is about trying to manage the disruption of Brexit to limit that disruption to the greatest extent possible. And what I often say to unionists is, look, the choice was to have checks in two ports and an airport or to have checks in over 300 road crossings between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Yeah. You know, and it's self-evident, which is, you know, which is the easier to implement. Um, so, but that doesn't solve the political problem. The political problem now is we have to find a way of reducing those checks and reducing the disruption of the protocol in a way that reasonable people in the, in, in the unionist community can accept. Mm -hmm. And I have a, 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 an obligation to try to do that. At the moment, there is real tension between unionism, nationalism, between some in the executive in Northern Ireland and the Irish government, and of course, the EU. And even today, you know, a couple of hours ago, I was speaking to Vice President Sefcovic of the commission, who's the key person on the EU side, who is trying to find ways in which we can introduce uh, extended grace periods, flexibilities, uh, new arrangements that can reduce that um, uh, inspection burden, if you like, on yeah. goods coming into Northern Ireland. The easiest way that we can do that is to actually agree a veterinary agreement between the UK and the EU to maintain a common approach to standards. If we do that, we could reduce checks in Northern Ireland ports on goods coming from, from GB by up to 70 to 80%. In other words, you wouldn't have to check food products anymore. Uh, I mean, and that would be, um, that would be a, 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 a huge step forward. Uh, whether it's enough for some in the unionist community, probably not, but it, but it would still be uh, something positive that I think we can work on. Yeah, I mean, because it begs the question, what on earth are the British proposing to put in their sausages? You know, I mean, you do kind of think, well, surely they want to maintain food standards. But the inside yeah, it, those yeah, it's not as simple as that, though, because you see what they will say is, look, we want to do trade agreements with other parts of the world. So if we want to do an agreement with Canada, for example, that allows beef to be imported that is produced with the use of hormones, uh, or if we want to Im import product that is, uh, that is genetically modified in terms of seeds and so on, that aren't products that aren't allowed into the EU single market, but the UK may want to do deals on, then that creates a compromising position for them. Well, isn't, this, isn't this at the heart of Brexit, of the difficulty that your biggest market is next door? I mean, is, are these foreign markets really going to substitute for the EU? And over time, are we looking at the kind of the Brexit fever breaking so that eventually you get back to the kind of the economic gravity of trading with your neighbours that over time is will sure Britain look, must converge or are they that determined to go their own way? Well, I mean, I would say that, that I mean, I, and I've spoken to a lot of people and I've debated with a lot of people on the merits of Brexit. I have never heard anybody make a coherent argument uh, that Brexit makes sense from a trade perspective. Right. So um, the arguments are, are framed in the context of identity, of Britain's standing in the world, uh, of Britain's global perspective, of Britain being free to do what it wants, rather than having to compromise in the context of being an EU member state. But the actual raw numbers themselves, in like Britain's largest trading partner by a country mile is the UK, or, or is, the, is the EU. Mm, I mean- And Ireland. Okay. Like, like even with Ireland, I mean, like the relationship between Britain and Ireland is an 80 billion euro trade relationship. Yeah. You know, yeah. Ireland is, is the UK's fifth largest trade partner and mm -hmm. actually has a trade surplus with Ireland. A lot of people don't, don't realize that. Um, you know, Britain sells more to Ireland than it purchases from Ireland. Yeah. Um, yeah. Considerably more, actually. Um, so, so, you know, it doesn't make sense that, okay, you sign a trade deal with Australia, which, you know, the British government have been making a big, a big deal out of, and 
it is a big deal because it's their first big trade deal. But, you know, the numbers in comparison to even the trade figures with Ireland, never mind the rest of the EU, uh, you know, are really only a fraction of, uh, you know, of what they're undermining by actually driving the, the type of Brexit that they've insisted upon. But look, you, we have to respect that decision. It's a decision that the British people have made democratically. Um, I, I'm not sure that it was an honest debate, by the way, in terms of the build up to that vote. But mm. that's really not for me to comment on. Uh, they've made that decision. We have to respect it. We have to make the best of it. And my job is to try to make sure that Ireland maintains the closest possible relationship with the United Kingdom, despite Brexit, and yeah. that we try to work with the British government to try to deal with what are very real tensions in Northern Ireland that could lead to the collapse of the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement and the executive and devolved government in Stormont if we don't manage this carefully through the summer. So yeah. it's, a, it's a serious issue that we shouldn't be in any way flippant about. Yeah. Can I ask you just on a more personal basis, you've been incredibly involved in big issues from Brexit to COVID, SECO, deeply involved in the European Union. Um, and we are a small country, and, and, but as a minister and as a politician and just as a human being, how does that, how's that, what has that experience been like? Well, I mean, I just take it week by week. You know, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I found, I mean, just, just when you think you're, uh, I mean, I've been very, very fortunate in politics. You know, I've been in politics at a really interesting time, a really challenging yeah. time. Um, I mean, I came into to government uh, in, in 2011 when the Irish economy was on the floor, where, when Irish politics in terms of reputation was on the floor. Uh, and we had, to, we had the IMF effectively making decisions, financial yeah. decisions for, for the Irish government. Um, so we thought that that was going to be the biggest challenge of our... You know, of our political careers, you know, all of us who were part of that government uh, led by Enda Kenny. And we set about trying to rebuild the economy, get people back to work, build a confidence again in Ireland, rebuild a reputation within the European Union, because we were very much seen as the problem child, along with Portugal and Greece at the time. Um, and, you know, I think we managed over a period to, to generate this fantastic new growth story in Ireland. Um, which wasn't without sacrifice, by the way, and making some pretty unpopular decisions in government because mm. we didn't get thanked for it, you know, in the subsequent elections. But, but my party, and I've been fortunate to, to be able to stay in government, even though we've had two quite poor general elections. Um, but then, you know, just when we thought we had the economy purring again, Irish people back to work, and, and we wanted to spend that money in terms of improving people's incomes and quality of life, um, uh, and putting it into, you know, shaping a more sustainable economy, then we get hit by Brexit out of, out of left field. Uh, one. Which was this, this huge political challenge for us where effectively Ireland had to compete with the might of the UK yeah. in the context of their diplomatic lobbying right across the European Union to try to frame the Irish issues um, uh, as not overly significant, uh, which was the line from the British government. Um, we won that argument within the EU. Well, the things uh, rings to, around them, Minister. The British. Well, well I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I have a lot of respect for Britain uh, and their yeah. diplomatic service. Um, and I mean, I would say we won that argument because, you know, the truth holds in politics, you know, and this was a very real problem. The Good Friday Agreement was potentially going to be undermined in, in a fatal way. I would say. I mean, yeah. if we were forced to put a border up, a trade border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, that would have been seen by many people North and South as the reimposition of, uh, of a trade barrier. Uh, and I think it would have been politically catastrophic in Ireland, mm -hmm. North mm -hmm. and South. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it would have been the end of the Good Friday Agreement in terms of institutions. Yeah. Um, and, um, and we would have faced some very, very difficult choices. So that didn't happen. We managed to avoid it. The protocol was the price of that, uh, um, uh, which was, I think, sort of the least damaging option. Um, uh, but we're still trying to manage the fallout of that. And then if that wasn't enough, you know, COVID comes along. I know. Um, I, I, just when we thought we were starting to solve the Brexit issues, we're hit by COVID. Um, and then, of course, we have these fantastic new opportunities on the Security Council where we had this really competitive contest with Canada. And we, and we managed not to fall out with Canada during that contest. But 
But it's been you extraordinarily know, it, it, successful. What strength do you think we bring to this that make us, I mean, we did win the SECO campaign. We did get a good deal out of Brexit. We've managed COVID. I mean, and, you know, Ireland has got a bigger reputation abroad than our size would dictate. And, you know, we're coming up to 100 years of independence. When you look back on this, you know, what do you think Ireland brings to this in terms of characteristics or energy or, or perspectives? Um, well, I, I think relationships. You know, mm. I mean, you know, Ireland is, uh, Ireland doesn't have too many notions about itself. You know, we're a small country that likes to build partnerships and friendships. We have a diaspora of about 70 million people right across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, four and a half million Canadians uh, have an affinity and a connection and an emotional uh, connection with Ireland. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the United States, it's an even bigger number. Uh, in Australia, you know, at one point, up to 40% of the Australian population was Irish. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, even in a city like Buenos Aires, uh, in Argentina, you know, 200,000 people in Buenos Aires uh, some of whom can't even speak English, are, you know, consider themselves of Irish descent. So, I mean, I think the diaspora has certainly something to do with that. Uh, it opens mm. doors for us. Uh, 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 many people are reminded that Ireland isn't just about five million people living on an island in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that has, you know, tentacles that spread right across the world. Um, but, but, you know, we work hard. We work hard on being non-threatening, uh, on being, I hope, relatively humble uh, about how we go about our work. Um, and that helps as well in parts of the world where, you know, I mean, our pitch for the Security Council was we can be a voice for small nations. Right. We, we yeah. can be a voice for countries that don't feel represented. Uh, and we can speak to power uh, in a way that many other small countries don't get the access to do. Uh, and we have this extraordinary privilege in Washington or indeed in in countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and the UK, uh, you know, uh, and Paris, and Germany, you know, and Berlin and so on. As a small country, we do have connections that we've worked hard to build and maintain and create. Uh, and so certainly my sales pitch to so many small African countries or small island developing states uh, or small countries in Asia, I've said, look, you know, we're a country like you that's been colonized in our history, um, uh, that, that was a very, very poor country, uh, largely driven by agriculture, that has, yeah. that has experienced famine, uh, that has millions of people who were forced to leave uh, to, to go to other parts of the world. Uh, and now we're this country that is wealthy, privileged, uh, progressive, growing, and influential, uh, even though we're relatively small. Uh, we're a country you can talk to, uh, and 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 we'll listen. Um, yeah. And you know that was a message that I think was very compelling for a lot of countries that that believe in multilateralism and need the UN to be a voice for them. And mm -hmm. many of them come and talk to us now about uh, how we can represent them uh, at the top table, which is the Security Council. Great. Just a final question. You know, uh, are you worried about the, the world our children will live in in terms of climate change? Are we making enough progress? towards remitting uh, the challenges that we face in terms of sustainability? Well, I mean, I'm worried about the direction the world is going in lots of ways, um, mm. but, but there's also cause to be optimistic too. But I mean, you have, I mean, there are over 80 million people internally displaced in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. Most of them living in refugee camps, which is more than we've ever seen in history. Um, when Ireland was last on the Security Council 20 years ago, the Security Council was dealing with 13 files. It's yeah. now dealing with over 30. So we have three times the number of conflicts that we're trying to manage. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if we continue on that trajectory, uh, the world is going to be a very violent um, uh, and very tragic place. Mm -hmm. and, and when you add climate action to that, or the lack of climate action and climate change to that in terms of disruption, uh, in terms of increasing uh, pressures around competition for scarce and shrinking natural resources like water and land mm -hmm. uh, that are going to be needed to, to service dramatically growing populations, ironically, in the parts of the world that can least afford to cope with that. You know, there, there's going to be an extra billion people on the continent of Africa in the next 30 years. 
Yeah. An extra billion people. Mm. Um, twice, that's twice the population of the European Union in, in 30 years. Mm. Um, and, you know, we see the challenges on the continent of Africa right now with the existing uh, population that's there. So there are enormous challenges uh, for, um, for the UN uh, and for other multilateral uh, organizations to, uh, to respond to. Um, do I believe it's possible to do it? Yes, I do. Uh, are we learning lessons from COVID? Yes, we are. Um, uh, are we finally starting to understand the magnitude of the challenge when it comes to climate action? I think so. In the developed world, certainly in Europe, in the US and Canada uh, 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 and other um, you know, countries in, in the developed world, yes, I think we are. In China too, I think they're, they are understanding the magnitude of the challenges we face. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the problem is the, the longer we leave it to respond in the kind of dramatic way that's needed, the more difficult the mountain becomes to climb. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so I think, you know, my generation of politician and the generation that will follow will face extraordinary global challenges. And mm-hmm. Ireland as a, as a little island and Canada as a huge landmass happen to be in probably the two safest parts of the world, <laughs> uh, just because of where we are geographically. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean we can afford to ignore what's happening south of us. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, because I think you will see mass movement of people uh, as a result of, of some of these challenges, mostly driven by conflict, actually, mm-hmm. which, is, which is man-made. Some mm-hmm. of it driven by, um, uh, by a scarcity of resources and, uh, and the acceleration of the problem through climate change. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature. Um, you know, I felt when we came into government in 2011, that, that we could solve the problem and rebuild an economy and get society back into a place where they could be proud again. Um, I felt we could, we could get solutions to Brexit when many other people didn't. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm less optimistic actually about, about COVID because I think there's still a lot, of travel, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of tragedy to unfold in many parts of the world, but we will get on top of that. But on the climate change is, I think, probably the most significant challenge of, of this generation. Um, yeah. And if we don't, if we don't respond in a way that I believe we have a moral obligation to, well, then I think our, our children, uh, in terms of the history books that they'll be reading, uh, will be very damning uh, of, of our generation. When we have the technology and the science to understand the magnitude of the challenge, if we choose not to respond, um, um, I believe we will be, um, we will be blamed in a very direct way for, uh, for limiting their opportunities uh, mm. as, a, as a generation to follow. It's essentially generational theft yeah. is what we're talking about uh, mm. I- in terms of uh, them not being able to experience and enjoy and benefit from the kind of ecosystems and the kind of biodiversity that we, that we have today. Um, but look, maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting a bit too highbrow now. In no, terms no, of no, discussion. absolutely. I mean, um, I found... This is by and large uh, a group of business people, but... But, but in many ways, these challenges are going to drive the new economy. They're shape business Wait till you see how many people in Ireland are employed in the, in, the, in the energy, food, construction sectors, uh, transport sectors, uh, directly linked with new technologies around reducing yeah. emissions uh, uh, and mitigating against the changes of, of climate change and adapting to the new realities in terms of flood relief programs and so on. Uh, it's going to be a huge shaper of the economy that we're going to build in the next 20 years. No, I totally agree, Minister. I mean, COVID has given us that lesson that the companies that adapted most quickly to COVID through digital technology, for example, were, are the ones that have prospered. I think exactly the same, as you say, is for companies and climate change. The ones who adapt will survive in, in the new world we find ourselves in. Mr. Minister, great pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for your time and uh, look forward to welcome you to uh, Canada in person hopefully sooner rather than later. So, uh, and very, very best of luck with your very busy agenda. So back to you, Jackie. Thank Thanks, you. Well, I, I, I second that, Ambassador. Um, Minister, we very much look forward to you coming to Canada and based on uh, your answers today and the comments from our viewers and the discussion with Ambassador and yourself, we invite you to uh, a very large open session, if that's possible. 
and uh, we can fill the room, I think. The uh, comments have been uh, very supportive and very inquisitive uh, with our viewers wanting to know more. So thank you very much indeed for that. We also hope that you enjoyed your quick tour around Canada and those viewing the week quick tour around Ireland. But um, we want to thank our gold sponsors, uh, Shopify, obviously, who are in Ireland as, as well as here in Canada. And Shopify is where you can start a business or grow the existing one with their all-in-one commerce platform, as you know. And a shout out to our other sponsors, Satanta Solutions Canada, good Irish name there, Satanta, um, providing technical solutions and professional services. And before you leave us, Minister, a heartfelt thank you from the Irish diaspora here in Canada for all the support provided by your department and the Immigrant Support Programme. Examples of the COVID-specific outreach are the activities of the PanCan Chambers, the individual chambers, and indeed that of the Ireland-Canada Immigration Centre, who in these very challenging times of COVID have been assisting those in crisis and helping the community access resources for mental health and well-being. So shout out to all involved. Minister Coveney, Ambassador McKee, and indeed to our viewers today, be well, merci, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jackie, and thanks to everybody. I look forward to making it over in person. Let's get back to Ireland. Back to the land you call home. The place where it all began. Back to laughing with family and making new friends. Back to losing track of time and back to showing how it's done. Or maybe how it's not. So sit tight, because we're rolling out the green carpet and when the time is right, an especially warm welcome awaits you on the island of Ireland.